Hi, welcome to Capital City Sports. I'm Jonathan Hilliard. And I'm Meredith Harvey. It's been a busy month in sports, but don't worry, because in the next hour, we'll get you all caught up on the USC action. Coming up on this edition of Capital City Sports, the USC football team wrapped up their season in Memphis, Tennessee in the AutoZone Liberty Bowl. Did the Gamecocks go out on top? And the holidays were filled with more great bowl game action all across the SEC. We'll show you how the conference performed against the nation's other top conferences. We'll also unveil the all-new Capital City Sports Boardroom. The guys will recap this season in college football and look ahead to the 2007 season. And it wouldn't be January without a little college hoops action. We'll bring you the latest news and highlights from Gamecock basketball. Finally, we'll take a look at the scene in the National Football League. It's playoff time, so that means some coaches are making a push to the Super Bowl and others are looking for a job. We'll tell you who found one over the break. All that is coming up on Capital City Sports. Don't go away, we'll be right back. What is your problem, Ed? All right, what's going on here, fellas? The missile was about to hit the school. That doesn't change the fact that I don't have a car anymore. Who just throws a person's car at a missile? You're serious? Yeah, who's gonna pay for my car? It's easy to tell if you've had way too many. But what if you've had just one too many? Buzz driving is drunk driving. Frozen Peas. Respected member of our community for years. Determined to always do just the right thing. Committed to support the growth of our children and effective at lowering bad cholesterol. Frozen peas, courage, integrity, fresh ideas. This message paid for by the friends of frozen peas. If you're not voting, then who are you electing? Welcome back to Capital City Sports. The Gamecock football team saw a lot of opportunities come and go in 2006 and finished the season on a roll. But could they keep that up into the AutoZone Liberty Bowl? Our own Jonathan Hilliard has highlights. Hardware there waiting on the champs of the 48th annual AutoZone Liberty Bowl featuring the Houston Cougars of Conference USA, the champions of Conference USA. They finished 10 and three against the South Carolina Gamecocks of the SEC, who finished seven and five with two straight wins at the end of the season to come into the bowl game. But early in the game, it was Houston who would strike first. This is Kevin Cobb finding Vincent Marshall for 32 yards and a touchdown, seven nothing Cougars. Kevin Cobb, a, one of the top quarterbacks in the country this season, his senior year. As you can see on the replay, not a whole lot of defense on this play, but nevertheless, seven nothing Cougars. But Gamecocks, dang, skirt. Corey Boyd, doo, 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 17 yards. First down inside Houston territory. Corey's excited. He's a little excited. And he would finish off the drop. Two yards, touchdown. 7 7, tie ball game. Gamecocks would get the ball back after a stop. And this time it's Blake Mitchell dropping back. He's looking deep for his favorite target, Sidney Rice, on the corner out. Makes the catch. Goes out of bounds at the Houston 26 for a 43-yard first down. This time it's Blake Mitchell play fake looking for the Canadian Robert Pavlovic. Touchdown, Gamecocks. They would miss the extra point, though. 
13-7 Carolina in the second quarter. Back comes Houston. Cobb to Anthony Aldridge down the sideline. He makes one man miss and he's down to the 16-yard line. A couple plays later, Cobb spreading the ball around. It's Mark Hafner this time, four yards and the score. Houston goes back up on top. Make note of that clock, six minutes and 12 seconds left. It's 14-13 Houston in the first half. But here come the Gamecocks. Blake Mitchell looking for his favorite target yet again. Sidney Rice in the corner. I don't think he got a foot down. Well, referees seem to think so. Touchdown is signaled for the Gamecocks. Could he get a foot down? Let's take a look at that old instant replay. Sidney in the corner of the end zone. The catch and the drag. What a grab by Sidney Rice. And it's 20 to 14, Carolina late in the second quarter. But right back comes Houston with two minutes left. This time it's Jackie Battle up the middle. 42 yard run, he's in the end zone. Touchdown, Houston. It's 21-20, Cougars. Wow, what an offensive show. Back come the Gamecocks. Blake Mitchell looking for guess who. Sidney Rice over the middle, 29 yards to the Houston 36. And a first down for the Gamecocks, and they're going to pound it in. Give it to the workhorse, Corey Boyd from the Houston nine yard line. Do, 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 do. Up the middle, touchdown, his second of the day, and it's gonna be 27-21 Carolina after the extra point. 42 seconds left, you think, oh, half's over. Not Kevin Cobb, up the middle, looking, finds his favorite target, Vincent Marshall, and he can run. Down the sideline, straight out, outruns the Carolina defense. Don't hate the player, hate the game. 28-27 Houston at the half. Second half, different story. Third and goal for Houston. Kevin Cobb trying to recover the bobbled snap and kicks it out of bounds. Wait, he can't do that. Referee confirms that'd be cheating on the offense. 15 yard penalty from the spot of the foul. Fourth and 50 for Houston. They'd have to punt despite having first and goal on the eight yard line of Carolina. Now, Blake Mitchell going deep for Kenny McKinley. Blake spread the ball around excellent in the Liberty Bowl. He finds McKinley for the 43 yard touchdown and it's 36 28 game cut. McKinley and Mitchell aren't done though. After a three and out by Houston, Mitchell dropping back. Looking for McKinley on the right side this time. Gives him a little room. McKinley makes a catch. The juke, and nobody's going to catch him. Just quit trying. Touchdown, Gamecocks. McKinley shows off the arm. Fires one about 50 rows up into the stands. But it's a touchdown nonetheless. Take a look at the replay. Mitchell to McKinley on the side. Watch him stop on a dime. And he knows he's got a touchdown, ladies and gentlemen. There's the arm on Kenny McKinley. And it's 44-28, Gamecocks. The Houston Cougars are done, right? No way they can keep up with this SEC team in the fourth quarter. Well, we'll find out. Gamecocks trying to ice it. Fourth and one after Houston scores. Cannot get the first down, and the Cougars are going to have a chance to tie the game here. Only down eight in the fourth quarter. But after a Gamecock stop, Houston got the ball back. This is their last chance effort. No time on the clock. They find Vincent Marshall. He's got some running room, but the Carolina defense does a good job of containing him to the sideline makes a tackle, and the Gamecocks would be victorious. Let the celebration begin. Gamecocks are Liberty Bowl champions. Their first bowl win under Coach Steve Sprayer and Kenny McKinley doing some celebrating. Give our defensive players uh, credit for stopping them guys to win the game for us. So, good win. Uh, eight wins is good for us right now. Seven last year. We shoot for nine or ten next year. And I think around the country, uh, it's, it's getting known now that University of South Carolina can compete at the highest level. Our fans are there, they, they follow the team. I think we sold more tickets than Auburn and uh, some of the other SEC big time teams to the bowl games. So we really appreciate our fans and it was neat that we can give them a victory. Say it ain't so, Sydney. That's the tune of Carolina fans after USC star receiver Sydney Rice declared himself eligible for the 2000 NFL Draft earlier this month. Rice said that while he wanted to stay at Carolina, the financial security of the NFL was too much to pass up. A Gaffney native, Rice will leave as South Carolina's all-time leader in touchdown catches in a season and in a career after only playing two seasons in a Carolina uniform. Rice is not the only receiver who will leave early to try this luck in the NFL. Those declaring themselves eligible early include Calvin Johnson of Georgia Tech, 
Dwayne Jarrett of Southern Cal, and Ted Ginn Jr. of Ohio State. Coming up on Capital City Sports, we'll dive into all the SEC Bowl action. The SEC was matched up against some tough competition but was up to the challenge. For highlights of some of the holiday season's most exciting ball games, stay tuned to SGTV. We'll be right back. What is your problem, man? You're welcome. Uh, what the heck is wrong with you? What do you mean? Don't give me that! All right, what's going on here, fellas? The missile was about to hit the school. I just acted as fast as I could. That doesn't change the fact that I don't have a car anymore. Who just throws a person's car at a missile? You're serious? Yeah, who's gonna pay for my car? I guess I could. Do you even have a real job? Yes. Do you have insurance? I saw the whole thing. Call me. The bear climbed over the mountain. The bear climbed over the mountain. The bear climbed over the mountain. And what do you think he saw? What do you think he saw? What do you think he saw? The bear climbed over the mountain, the bear climbed over the mountain, the bear climbed over the mountain, and what do you think he saw? season that the SEC was the best conference around. And this holiday season, they had something to back that up. Back to Jonathan Hilliard with highlights from this season's bowl games. First up, we've got the Music City Bowl featuring Clemson versus Kentucky. Kentucky in their first bowl game since 1999. Early in this game, it's Andre Woodson. He scrambles for a gain of seven. Woodson led the SEC this season in passing in his second QB rating, but showing off the legs early in this game. Now you see the arm Woodson's got. This time it's Woodson and Jacob Tammy for 20 yards down to the Clemson 35-yard line. That was set up a score later on. It's Micah Johnson up the middle, leaps over the pile for the one-yard TD. UK goes up 7-0. But don't count out the Tigers just yet. Clemson, next drive, it's James Davis up the middle in thunder as Clemson fans like to call him. Tramples 21 yards up the middle to the UK 22. But it's Jad Dean, remember? He missed the tying field goal against USC, and now he misses his first field goal against Kentucky. That's, that was a 32-yarder that he missed early in that game. And now it's him later on in the first quarter. He misses a 28-yard. The kicking troubles continue for the Tigers in this game. In the first quarter, Tommy Bowden, he's not real pleased with what he's seeing here. Remember in the Florida State game, he said he was done kicking. Uh, well, he probably should have been done kicking in this game as well. But here's a crazy sequence. Clemson later on in the first quarter, they find Darrell Berry. 28 yards and, oh, excuse me, 32 yards and the touchdown at 7-6, but Clemson misses the extra point. Still 7-6, Wildcats. The first play UK has from scrimmage after the kickoff is Raphael Little. He fumbles, is recovered by Clemson, and all of a sudden the Tigers are in the driver's seat, right? Wrong. First play, Will Proctor dropping back. Looking for Cha Chauncey Stuckey in the corner. He finds Trevard Lindley. By the way, he plays for Kentucky. 
taking a look at the instant replay. Proctor looking for Chauncey Stuckey in the corner. Javard Lindley might have gotten away with a little pass interference here, but still a great catch and a pull down to get the interception. Gives the ball back to the Wildcats and avoids the Clemson score. Later on, it's Andre Woodson dropping back, looking for DeMario Ford up the middle, and he is behind the defense. You talk about Clemson speed, Mario Ford looks pretty quick. That's 70 yards and a touchdown. It's 14-6 at halftime. UK opens the floodgates in the second half. This time, Wesley Woodyard gets to Will Proctor. They ruled out a fumble. UK jumps on it and gets the ball back. A few plays later, it's Andre Woodson. This time, he's looking for Dickie Lyons. He faked out the camera crew on that foot. Dickie Lyons in the end zone, 24 yards, touchdown. 21-6 Wildcats. Clemson's going to have to stop them if they, uh, if they expect to stay in this game. But now on to the fourth quarter. It's Woodson again. This time he's looking. Again, he can't find anybody. The fake. The fake. Oh, he's looking. He finds Jacob Tammy in the end zone. That flag would be on Clemson. UK would go on to win this game 28-20. to And Clemson loses their four out of the last five games. Kentucky wins five out of their last six. SEC one, ACC zero. On the next matchup of ACC and SEC, we go to the Chick-fil-A Bowl in Atlanta. This would pit the Georgia Bulldogs against the Virginia Tech Hokies. Georgia beat Auburn and Georgia Tech at the end of the season. Virginia Tech, one of only four teams to go to a bowl game in 14 straight seasons. Unbelievable. First quarter, it's Matt Stafford. Dropping back, the freshman is picked off by Brendan Hill at the UGA 17-yard line. That's just the M.O. of Virginia Tech right there, playing good defense, playing good special team. Here comes the Virginia Tech offense. It's going to be star running back Brandon Orr, taking the ball right up the middle on fourth and goal, and he gets in for the score. It's 7-3 Virginia Tech early in the second quarter. The Hokies weren't done. A lot of Hokie fans in Atlanta, by the way, but Georgia goes three and out, has to punt. It's Eddie Royal back to receive. He goes right through two Georgia defenders, makes a man miss, and he is off to the races. He would run 56 yards to the UGA 30. That would set up another offensive possession inside Georgia territory, and it's Brandon Orr on second and goal. It looks like Georgia stuffs him at the goal line, but upon further review, you can take a look at it. Orr goes up, is hit. Reaches the ball out. Upon further review, it is a touchdown. 14 to 3. Hokies. But the Hokies weren't done yet again. This time it's Sean Glenn and his lateral is deflected, but Eddie Royal still catches the ball. And he's going deep. He finds his target, and that's a 53 yard touchdown. Virginia Tech goes up 21 to 3 at halftime. ACC whooping up on the SEC early in this one, but Georgia, after a field goal in the second half, gets the onside kick, and wait a second, we might have a ball game here. This time, it's the young quarterback, Matthew Stafford. Now you see Frank Beamer there. They just got him with my own medicine, basically. Mark Grick, I can do it too, coach. Anyways, Matthew Stafford this time. You see the youngster lining up under center. He's looking for his favorite target, Martrez Milner. He's got him in the back of the end zone. Touchdown, Georgia. It would be 21-13 late in the third quarter. After a stop, Georgia's got the ball back. This time, Matty Stafford is going to drop back. You see, obviously, a lot of Georgia fans in the Georgia Dome. But Matthew Stafford dropping back. Plays a little hide-and-seek with the football. Finds Milner down the field for 41 yards. And they have the ball first and goal at the one. Get in the end zone, big fella. Give me a break. But... This time, it's Craig Lumpkin on the misdirection. The Atlanta native Craig Lumpkin. That's a touchdown. Georgia would go for two and would get it. Virginia Tech trying to stop the bleeding. It's quarterback Sean Glennon. The pass is tipped, intercepted by Tony Taylor, and he's tackled at the one-yard line, setting up the Georgia offense in the fourth quarter. But don't give it to him yet. First down, Georgia stuck. It's Danny Ware. Can't get in the end zone. Brandon Sutherland on second down. Can't get in third down for Georgia at the one and this time they're going to pass it almost picked off intended for Martrez Milner can't get in but on fourth down if you try you will succeed Brandon Sutherland in the end zone 
Georgia makes it 30 to 21. They would go on to win 31 to 24. Now on to the Nokia Sugar Bowl. This pits the LSU Tigers playing in their backyard in New Orleans from Baton Rouge. The first Sugar Bowl played since Hurricane Katrina in the Superdome, but Notre Dame's got a hefty crowd there as well to see Brady Quinn's last game. Early first quarter, it's Charlie Weiss showing some trickery, going for it on fourth down with the fake LSU. Saying not so much. The home fans love it. Early in this game, Charlie Weiss, the gamble doesn't pay off. But first play from LSU. Jamarcus Russell looking for early do set down the sideline. He's got it down to the one yard line. And from there, it would be Keelan Williams doing the rest. Give it to the back, big fella. Here it is, up the middle, 7-0 LSU. Keelan Williams, three yards and a touchdown. Later in the first quarter, it's, as you see the home fans getting all riled up yet again. Later in the first quarter, it's Jamarcus Russell dropping back. He finds Dwayne Bow over the middle, 11 yards for the touchdown, 14-0 LSU. Jamarcus Russell had an outstanding season. He's going to the NFL. But here come the Irish. This time it's Brady Quinn looking for his running back. Darius Walker hits him over the middle. Walker finds some running room. He goes 22 yards out to midfield. Brady Quinn, next play. He's looking for David Grimes on the left side. Drops back, pump fake, 24 yards, end zone. Touchdown, Irish, it's 14 to seven. Irish came to play. After uh, a couple tough losses in, in this season to USC and Michigan, Irish want to prove they belong. This time it's Jeff Samarja finding the end zone, and we've got a tie ball game in the Sugar Bowl, but that's as close as it would get. LSU comes right back. This time it's a stud to Marcus Russell. He's going to run the ball. Try tackling that 260-pound mammoth. Up the middle, touchdown, 21-14 LSU. This time off his back foot, 58 yards to Brandon LaFell. Touchdown, Tigers. Home crowd fired up, but they're not done. Keelan Williams juking, jiving, and celebrating in the end zone. Touchdown, Tigers. LSU would go on to win this game, 41-14, and the home fans that's what they've been saying all year is SEC is the dominant conference. We just had no idea how dominant they would be. Now to the national championship game. It's the Florida Gators, 11-1, taking on the 12-0, or excuse me, 12-0 Ohio State Buckeyes opening kickoff. Ted Ginn Jr. He feels it up the middle, is going to make break one tackle, and he is off to the races. SEC speed. He's got some Big Ten speed right there, and Teddy Ginn Jr., he's going pro. Nonetheless, he takes it to the house for the college Ohio State Buckeyes. It's 7-0 early. OSU looking for their second national championship in four years. But on the ensuing kickoff, Brandon James up the middle for the Gators. He's got some room. He was His face mask was held. That's 15 yards. Now, Chris Lee for the Florida Gators. Then he scurred. This time it's Chris Leak to Billy Latsko in the flat. Hits his fullback. That's going to be a gain of 14 yards. And the Gators are in Buckeye territory. A couple plays later, Chris Leak looking for Dallas Baker. The little pump fake. The toss over the corner. And the Gators got it. Touchdown. And answer Ohio State immediately. Shocking the Buckeye defense. Quick. It's 7 7. Now to the real story of the game, the Gator defense. Troy Smith, Heisman Trophy winner back, is sacked by Derek Harvey. That happened five times, by the way. Now, give it back to the Gators. This time it's Chris Lee looking for his tight end, Cornelius Ingram finds him in the flat. That's a first down and much more. 20 yards to the Ohio State seven yard line. Give it to the freshman, Percy Harvin. Going out wide, the option pitch, Percy. Doesn't look like he has much room, but somehow manages to get in. Questionable call on the play. The ref ruled for the touchdown. Take a look at the replay. Looks like he might have been down a little short. Ladies and gentlemen, that controversy was forgot about at the end of this game. Just a little hint for you. Anyways, 
again, Troy Smith under pressure. It's Derek Harvey yet again chasing down the Heisman Trophy winner. Just he had to have his dreams haunted that night by Florida defensive ends. Now under pressure, Smith throws the interception to Reggie Lewis, and the Gators get the ball back with a 14-7 lead. This time it's Chris Leak to Cornelius Ingram. Watch the senior thread the needle. He's been criticized his entire career at Florida, not anymore. Take a look at the replay. Chris Leak, the senior, drops back, reads the defense, finds his tight end. Beautiful throw. And the Gators are marching down the field again. This time, Deshaun Wynn right up the gut. Touchdown, Gators. They go up 21-7. Ohio State's got to answer. After the Ohio State scores, it's 27-14. They have a chance to get back in it. But Jarvis Moss hits Troy Smith, makes him fumble, and Derek Carvey is there to pick up the pieces. And the Gators have first and goal inside the 10-yard line. Guess who? Timmy Tebow. Looks like he's going to run. Not so fast. Flips it to Andre Caldwell for the touchdown. And the Gators have a 34-14 lead at halftime. Ladies and gentlemen, that's all they would need. Second half was fairly boring, to be completely honest with you. Gators completely dominate, hold Ohio State to 82 yards of total offense, and then let the celebration begin in Gainesville. Urban Meyer with the Gatorade shower. You see Chris Lee. What redemption for the senior from Charlotte, North Carolina. Gets a national championship. Coming up next, we'll unveil Capital City Sports' newest segment, The Boardroom. Our analysts will wrap up the season in college football and tell you who to keep an eye on for next season. Don't change that channel. There's much more to come. He'll be a senator with integrity. He has my family's future in mind. He cares about young people. He's a hard worker. He's focused. Effective. I believe in old relish back. We need a condiment with values. He'll represent us well in Washington, and he is so good looking. Old relish packet and I were trapped 50 miles behind enemy lines. He saved my life. This message paid for by citizens for old relish packet. If you're not voting, then who are you electing? Honey, it's Phil. The gold reserve is being attacked. Yeah. Don't forget to shut the window. <laughs> <laughs> what? What? All right. What's the joke? What's so funny? It's a new year, and that means a new segment for Capital City Sports. In the first episode of The Boardroom, the board will talk about 2006 college football, and it's never too early to jump ahead to next year. And now, Capital City Sports presents The Boardroom. Welcome to Capital City Sports' first edition of The Boardroom. On our panel today, to my left, I've got Tom Benning, staff writer for the State Newspaper. We also have A.J. Bembry, who is current 
uh, media relations assistant for the Columbia Inferno here in town. Thanks for joining us, guys. Here to my right, I've got Matt Moore, who is the USC correspondent for the Palestra and co-host of Capital City Sports Talk on WUSC with Tom. And farther to his right, I have Alex Riley, the current sports editor of the Daily Game. God, guys, thanks for joining us today. I said oh, excuse me. How could I forget Alex Riley's esteemed title of Columbia's best local writer voted uh, into the free times this year. By the way, that's two out of the last three years, is it not? Congratulations. Congratulations on that. Okay, guys, let's get right into it. Football season's wrapped up. The Liberty Bowl's over. The Gamecocks turn in an 8-5 and five record in year two of the Steve Spurrier era. Let's, let's talk about most valuable players. First on offense, Tom, who's your offensive MVP? Well, um, I guess you can, this maybe is a little bit unfair because you played defense the second part of the season for the most part, but I think it would be an injustice not to have Savelle Newton represented as the most valuable player somewhere. So I think his uh, you know, contributions first as wide receiver and as quarterback and then eventually as a, a safety were invaluable to the team, his leadership, his charisma. Um, I really think that he helped guide Carolina through some troubled waters. And I think, you know, maybe there's going to be some other candidates for offensive, you know, player of the year that may make more sense, but I think Savelle has to be represented somewhere. Well said. AJ, who's your offensive player of the year? Well, you know, the easy pick is to go with someone like Sidney Rice and to say, well, of all the things that he did. But I think what you really have to look at is the emergence of Kenny McKinley as a, as a legitimate number two wide receiver. He allowed the rest of the offense to take some pressure off of Rice and, and to really spread the ball around a lot more. And the fact that he emerged as a playmaker later on in the season means that it's really going to be easier for the team to absorb the loss of Sidney Rice when he goes to the NFL draft. And I think you can't overlook his ability and what he's going to mean to the team next year, especially in terms of bringing on another wide receiver to be one -two, a legitimate one-two punch again. Okay, we've got one vote for Savelle Newton. We've got one vote for Kenny McKinley. Matt Moore, who's your offensive MVP? I think you can't discount the fact that for about 100 minutes of Carolina football this year, the first 100 minutes, we'll say, the only person to score a touchdown was Corey Boyd. He found the end zone against Mississippi State. Granted, like that was kind of a, a given against Mississippi State, but only for Corey Boyd. I mean, he, he did everything he could as a receiver and a running back. I think he was definitely the offensive MVP this year. We'll put Alex Riley, who's your offensive MVP for 2006? Well, at an original point, I had Corey Boyd also as my offensive MVP. But when you go back and you think about some of the things that happened throughout the year for Carolina, Svel Newton, obviously a great pick, especially if you look at, at the first part of the season for Carolina. But I think uh, maybe the overall offensive player, uh, our offensive MVP, Corey Boyd, but from the Arkansas game on, Definitely Blake Mitchell. I mean, he came on uh, as strong as any other quarterback in the SEC. I mean, we all thought it was a joke when Steve Spurrier said that he could be an all-SEC candidate to start the season. Uh, but he came on really strong. And I think that even with Steven Garcia coming in and, uh, and uh, Chris Smelly going to be pushing for that job next year, uh, I still think Blake Mitchell is going to be the starter when things kick off for Carolina next year. Okay, so we've got a split panel here. We have Blake Mitchell, Corey Boyd. Savelle Newton and Kenny McKinley, no votes for Sidney Rice. Do you think the guys are a little bitter, maybe? I don't know, maybe that could be it. I, I would personally probably go with Sidney Rice, but we'll leave it as a split panel. Uh, well put, guys. As far as defensive MVP, we'll start on this side this time. Matt, who's your defensive MVP? I think the obvious choice is Jasper Brinkley. I th he led the team in tackles, had over twice as many tackles as the guy in second. He did everything on defense. He intercepted pass. I mean, he was he was there on every play just about. And as I'm sure Tom would say, all right, I won't, I'll leave it for Tom. But So I'll leave it at that. Jasper Brinkley's defensive MVP. Jasper Brinkley has one vote. Alex Riley, who's your defensive MVP? Well, just because I have a feeling that the other gentlemen at, these, at this particular table are also going to say A. Brinkley, probably the J. Brinkley. Uh, I'm going to go with actually Tom's offensive MVP. That's Savelle Newton. Uh, I think when they inserted him in on defense, if you go back and you look at the Carolina a secondary up until the point when Savelle Newton was back there. They were shaky at best. I mean, Carlos Thomas was giving up everything that was coming his way. Captain Munnell was developing, and things seemed to be going pretty haywire. I think the definition of Savelle Newton's big playability, yeah, Jasper Brinkley got Will Proctor at Clemson for the sack. If he doesn't get him, Savelle Newton gets him for the sack, no doubt, because he came untouched as well. So I think Savelle Newton is the defensive MVP this year. We got one vote Savelle Newton, one vote Jasper Brinkley. A.J. Bembry, who's your defensive MVP? 
Well, I, I got to agree with Matt. You know, the obvious choice is easily Jasper Brinkley because coming into this year, the Carolina defense was very young. They were very raw. You didn't really know what you were going to have. And then you had these two junior college transfers in the Brinkley brothers. And, you know, a lot of folks wanted them. And you weren't sure how they were really going to pan out when it came to playing against SEC offenses. And really, Jasper Brinkley solidified that defense and became the anchor, became the rock. He made that defense his defense. He basically took the leadership role that was there waiting for Fred Bennett. And you can't, dis you can't discount that. And going into next season, he's going to be the vocal leader. He's going to be the experienced guy. And the rest of the defense is really going to be able to take on his image. And that's why I think you, it, it has to be Jasper Brinkley. Two votes Jasper Brinkley and one vote Savelle Newton. Well, I'm going to go ahead and make this a three to one affair. Um, you know, pretty much sum it up by saying Jasper Brinkley brings the hot sauce. Absolutely. Every single play. By the way, I don't know if you noticed, but ESPN has picked up on the hot sauce reference. Have they? They have. That's NFL two. NFL game day That's used two. it twice. That's two. There you go. I'm right. going for it. So we've got three votes Jasper Brinkley, one vote Savelle Newton. Jasper Brinkley is your Capital City Sports Defensive MVP of 2006. I'd have to go with Jasper Brinkley as well. Let's move on. Uh, let's talk about guys that you didn't expect. Who's your surprise of 2006? Uh, positive. We won't go negative because we're a positive type of show. Let's be honest. We'll go positive surprise of 2006. We'll start it off with Alex Riley. Well, I think the surprise of the year, ironically for me, is Kenny McKinley. Uh, if you'd have told me at the beginning of the season that Kenny McKinley was going to have 800 yards receiving, I told you you were crazy. Um, because uh, I thought uh, I thought Sidney Rice was going to, of course, step up, have his 1,000-yard season, be the great receiver. Everybody wanted him to be at Carolina. And I really thought one of the new guys was going to step up. I thought maybe a... Uh, uh, O.J. Murdoch or a uh, Jared Cook was going to step up and become, you know, a threat to, to Sydney. You know, somebody equally as big, maybe a lot faster, something along those lines. But for Kenny McKinley to come up and be a viable threat, and the big thing about him that I loved was the fact that he's not afraid to go over the middle. I mean, he's no bigger than anybody at this table, and he will go over the middle and take lick after lick from SEC linebackers, which anybody will tell you is no small task. Uh, so I think he's my, my uh, surprise of the year, especially with his two touchdowns in the second half of the Liberty Bowl, which I think obviously helped Carolina to win. So he's my surprise of the year. Matt Moore, who's your surprise of the year? Well, like we were talking about Jasper earlier, I'm going to go with my surprise is Casper, because coming in, People knew about Jasper. People knew about Jasper and his twin brother. It was, I mean, Casper wasn't getting a whole lot of play before the season. But you think about that defensive line without him, with Stanley Doty not playing half the season for various reasons, Casper held things together. And I, I would definitely say he's my positive surprise of the year. Casper Brinkley and Kenny McKinley. Kenny McKinley. Tom Benning. Well, uh, you know, this is a surprise for me probably because I was down. I'm going to give this to a unit. I was down on this unit pretty much the entire year. But you look at what the offensive line did over the past, I don't know, three or four games of the season, you know, just the improvement from the beginning of the season to the end of the season, you know, certainly surprised me, surprised everybody in this, in this room, I know for sure. Um, you know, you have to give a lot of credit to the offensive line coach. His name escapes me right now. But John Hunt. John Hunt. John because, I mean, they were terrible at the beginning of the season. But, you know, they did a pretty good job shutting down Gaines Adam. Adams, uh, you know, Jarvis Moss didn't do a whole lot against us. So, and you know. the offensive line anyway. Right, that's true. <laughs> Kicking, maybe a little different story. <laughs> so I'm going to give it to the whole offensive line. I'm, I'm going to actually second that motion, and I'm going to add Jake's Broom, Jake Broom's comment. Here you go, Jake Broom. The offensive line started two Canadians, two uh, true freshmen, and two walk-ons at some point in this season. So when you throw in Canadians, you never know what's going to happen. <laughs> that being said, A.J. Bembry, who's your uh, surprise of 2006? Well, this one might come as a little bit of a shock, but my surprise of 2006 uh, is Savelle Newton. And it's not because we all knew that he was a great offensive player. We knew that he, was, uh, he would step in and play quarterback when needed. He was a wide out when needed. And even last year against Vanderbilt, we saw him as a running back. The guy did it all on the offensive side of the ball, but what really surprised me about Savell Newton was the level of dedication that he had to this team. He went out every single week, played his tail off, was showed up when the coaches wanted him to be there, showed up when he was asked to, did everything he could to help the team when the offensive line was struggling and when Blake Mitchell was struggling. He came in and he really led that team on offense for a little while, and then when he was no longer so needed on that side of the ball, he went and played a very fine safety in, in a defense, and 
you know, he's probably not going to be a draft pick. He may not go until the sixth or seventh round if he goes at all. But whoever picks up Savelle Newton is going to get one, themselves one hell of a football player. And you said it, said it perfectly, a hell of a football player, maybe not a hell of a quarterback, hell of a safety, but he'll do whatever you, he, you, know, you need him to do, and that's all you can ask. How about Captain Munderland, guys? As far as surprise. Well, I'd like to actually add on real quick to that pick. The reason, the other reason why I think that he could be the biggest surprise of the year is, I mean, what happened last year to him at the Vanderbilt game could have ended most careers for an average athlete. And for him to come in and to play wide receiver, tailback, quarterback, and safety all in the same season with a torn Achilles after what we saw out of him last year is, is impressive for anybody. That's a good pick for surprise of the year, actually. I'd, I'd, like, I'd like to second that because that is, that is excellent. So we've got two, the only one we have two picks. Are you changing your vote here, Riley? I'm not going to change my vote, okay. but if need be for tiebreakers, I will. Okay, for tiebreaker purposes, we'll say Savelle Newton is the Capital City Sports Surprise of 2006. Let's change it up a little bit, guys. The national scene, the SEC goes 6-3 and three in bowl games, and Florida takes OSU behind the woodshed and just beats them like they stole something, basically. And you look at LSU beating Notre, Notre Dame by the same score. What, I mean, do you guys see this coming? Should the country have seen this coming? Tom, I mean, should this have come as a surprise to us, or should we have expected this? Well, I think, you know, everybody got caught up in ESPN's, you know, game of the century, Ohio State versus Michigan. And I don't, I think it's, you know, just ludicrous to make a statement like that before, you know, you know a couple years later when you can look back on it. You know, Ohio State just was terrible. Like, it was probably one of the most lopsided games I've seen. You know, Florida just dominated physically, you know, speed-wise. You know, everybody talks about SEC being fast and the Big Ten being strong. Florida was just, you know. Fast and strong. It just, in every aspect of the game, that they dominate. Even their terrible, terrible kicker Absolutely. came through in the clutch. 82 yards of total offense for Ohio State, 34 passing yards That's for Troy incredible. Smith, the Heisman Trophy winner. A.J. Bembry, what, what struck you about that game? Like you said, that's the most lopsided defeat that we've had in a big-time bowl game since, well, coincidentally enough, that Nebraska destroyed Florida back in 95. <laughs> so, uh, you, you know, you have to give a lot of credit to Urban Meyer and, and the Florida staff, as much as I hate to admit it. They came through, the team showed up, they played hard, and they really exposed Ohio State for the fraud that they were. And we, like, like you said again about the LSU-Notre Dame game, did anyone see that coming? Notre Dame, it's up, guys. Give it up. You're not that good. <laughs> Everyone knew you weren't that good just because you can beat up Navy and Army. You know your only quality to win the entire year was against Georgia Tech, and Georgia Tech couldn't beat anybody down the stretch. So, Notre Dame, y'all suck. Give it up. The Fighting Catholics struggled down the stretch. They really did. And then they, they, they weren't even struggling down the stretch. They were terrible the entire year. They really weren't that good. Last year they got a lot of mileage out of barely losing the Southern Cal. You know, big deal. Right. Notre Dame, sorry. Well, we talked uh, about the national scene with these guys. I'll bring it to you guys to talk about USC's outlook for the 2007 season. You've, obviously, you lose Sidney Rice to the pros. You have Blake Mitchell back. You've got a lot of weapons on offense ba back. Matt, let's throw out a generic number. How many wins can this team realistically expect in 2007? I think you could realistically look at nine wins because of how good – I, I mean – I don't see them winning the SEC because of how good the SEC You, I mean, you look at LSU yeah, and Florida, chance, Auburn. Yeah. You've got teams up and down the line. And I wouldn't say that it's unrealistic to beat one of those teams, but you're not going to beat all three. And so I, w I would give uh, USC nine wins. I think the best thing to happen to USC is the quarterback battle that's going to, with Chris Smelly with uh, Steven Garcia and Blake Mitchell, because we're going to have a good quarterback in. And it's not going to be a question mark. Savelle came in and did wonderfully, but you never really knew. Before, everybody was like, oh, Savelle's playing quarterback. What's going to happen? I think we're going to have a good quarterback. And losing Sydney isn't, isn't as big a loss as people are making it out to be, in my opinion. The guy had four touchdowns against everybody except for Middle Tennessee State when he scored five. Like, do those really count? <laughs> and so I, I'm just uh, – I, I think that uh, nine wins is going to be a realistic goal for the Gamecocks. Well said, Alex Riley. How many wins can the Gamecocks look for in 2007? Well, I, I think that prior to Sidney Rice's departure, I would have easily spat off the number 10. I mean, easily. Um, now I say the same thing as Matt. I can see nine, but I will still say 10. 
And this is the reason why. I, I helped write the editorial today in our paper, and it was about Sidney Rice's departure to the NFL. And the last line that I used was actually from the man who recruited Sidney Rice to Carolina, and that's the illustrious Lou Holtz. Uh, and he, he said, uh, one of the things I'll never forget was, players will come and players will go, but someone will fall on the hand grenade for the welfare of the team. And I firmly believe that. I think if you go back and you look at Steve Spurrier's track record with receivers, that when one leaves, another one steps up. And that's the thing. Somebody will come up, and next year we'll have another 1,000-yard receiver, and it won't be Sidney Rice. It'll be somebody who catches 10 touchdowns. And it won't be a guy in the number four jersey with S. Rice on the back. You know, it'll be somebody else. And that's the thing is that Spurrier's going to produce no matter what. Yeah, Blake Mitchell and Sidney Rice had a great chemistry with each other. They knew where each other was going to be on the field. But who knows if Blake Mitchell makes it past game one next year. He'll make it to game one. He might not make it past game one. So to somebody will step up. I think realistically 10 wins. I don't think, though, that they will win the SEC. I think it will come down to possibly two undefeated teams in a Tennessee or a Florida meeting a South Carolina for the right to go to the SEC Eastern Division. But I, I think realistically 9 to 10 wins is, is doable for South Carolina next year. That's a good point. And you mentioned somebody stepping in. Uh, now is a good time to mention Spurrier's got the number seven recruiting class according to Rivals. As of now, that's got some potential to move up into a top five, a top three class with some key players up in the next couple weeks. It'll be interesting to see how they finish off and if any of those true freshmen can come in and, and really contribute as true freshmen. I think you've got a, a chance for some of the defensive guys to come in and contribute immediately. I don't know if you're going to have uh, a lot of offensive weapons immediately, but you never know, that's why it's recruiting and we'll, we'll just have to wait and see. Next up on Capital City Sports. The men's hoops team started SEC play this month and has already been faced with some tough competition. Find out how Coach Dave Odom and his squad handled the pressure after this break. Commissioner, hold on. I'll tell him. Honey, it's Phil. The gold reserve is being attacked. Tell him I'll be right there. Don't forget to shut the window. <laughs> what? What? All right. What's the joke? What's so funny? Frozen Peas, respected member of our community for years, determined to always do just the right thing, committed to support the growth of our children, and effective at lowering bad cholesterol. Frozen Peas, courage, integrity, fresh ideas. This message paid for by the friends of Frozen Peas. If you're not voting, then who are you electing? USC men's basketball team was thrown into the fire early in 2007, facing three top 25 caliber teams already. To find out how they fared, let's take a look at some highlights. Gamecocks starting off the new year in Athens, Georgia for their SEC schedule, taking on the Georgia Bulldogs under head coach Dennis Felton. The Georgia Bulldogs much improved. Gamecocks would hang around early in this one. You see Dominique Archie is going to drive this ball down the lane, shoots and scores. but. The Bulldogs were just too much for the Gamecocks. Here you see Steve Nelson, he hits the three. Georgia was inside and out on the Gamecocks and would go on to win. Gamecocks fall to 0-1 in SEC play. They would come back home 
take on the Florida Gators. You see Brandon Wallace, the spin. Gamecocks, despite falling down early, would make a game of it. We're at once just down four points. But here's the Gators. You see Joachim Noah, last year's NCAA tournament player and most valuable player. And Trey Kelly tried to take over this game, folks. Here he hits the three. He had 20 points in the first half. Watch him wheel and deal here later on in the first half. The spin move on Corey Brewer gets the lay-in, but it just wasn't enough for the Gamecocks later on in the second half. This time, it's the Gators yet again. This time, it's Lee Humphrey driving, goes around the pick, hits the jumper, and the Gators were just too much to handle. They would go on to defeat the Gamecocks by 34 in their second SEC game. Worst home loss since 1958. Later on, Gamecocks taking on perennial power Kentucky. The Wildcats coming in, not having the best team they've had in the last couple years, but Trey Kelly is going to try to pull the upset, and he's going to try to do it at points it looked like by himself. Early in the game, it's Kentucky. First half, Joe Crawford hits the three. He was all over the court, 16 points in the first half, but Trey Kelly, again, trying to do it all himself. Gets it to Evka Benoulas. Evka's been playing well. He hits the jumper. And the Gamecocks were within 10 points at the half, but Trey Kelly trying to do it all his own. You see the layup, but again, the Kentucky Wildcats would pull away and start pounding it inside to their big fella, Randolph Morris, you see here with the putback later on in the second half. Looking, looking, finds Randolph Morris. He gets the slam. And yet again, later on in the game, the dish, Randolph Morris makes him pay. Brandon Wallace, he cannot believe the bad luck they're having. The administration is still confident in Coach Dave Odom, though, as they signed him to a two-year contract extension last week. Coach Odom has led the Gamecocks to two NIT championships, but is having a hard time with the team this season. It's hard. It's hard. Uh, it's hard to talk to them and get, have them be positive. But I, I can. The one thing I do know is, I if I don't keep my confidence, if I don't stay uplifted, if I don't, you know, say good things to them, if I don't continue to coach them, they will not. They have no chance to do that. Um, I feel the same way about our fans. Um, our fans are, have been great, and and I've got to be as positive as I can with them. And you know, I, you know, I will take the responsibility. I mean, nobody has to. You know, write me ugly letters or say nasty thing. I mean, it's mine. That's my responsibility. I'll take it. I'm not absolving that. And we'll, um, you know, it's um, it's just it's funny how basketball goes. It's it's a. I've always felt basketball was a two week sport. I mean, you you look at you, you, a series of two week seasons, and we've just gone through a, <laughs> a horrible two weeks. Coming up next on Capital City Sports, we'll get you caught up on the NFL playoffs. And the season is over, which means coaching changes are imminent. To find out who landed their dream job, stay tuned to Capital City Sports. The bear climbed over the mountain, the bear climbed over the mountain, the bear climbed over the mountain, and what do you think he saw? What do you think he saw? What do you think he saw? The bear climbed over the mountain, the bear climbed over the mountain, the bear climbed over the mountain, and what do you think he saw? It's easy to tell if you've had way too many. But what if you've had just one too many? Buzz driving is drunk driving. What is your problem, man? You're welcome. What the heck is wrong with you? 
What do you mean? Don't give me that! All right, what's going on here, fellas? The missile was about to hit the school. I just acted as fast as I could. That doesn't change the fact that I don't have a car anymore. Who just throws a person's car at a missile? You're serious? Yeah. Who's gonna pay for my car? I guess I could. Do you even have a real job? Yes. Do you have insurance? I saw the whole thing. Call me. Now that the college game is over, pro football takes center stage. For more on the big boys' playoff run and some coaching changes, we'll go to our own Ed Cahill. The Alabama football program got an expensive Christmas present over the holidays when it ended its search for a head coach with the hiring of former Dolphins head coach Nick Saban. Saban, who won a national championship with LSU in 2003, was in his second year as head coach of the Miami Dolphins. He leaves behind the remainder of a five-year, $22 million deal with Miami to join the Crimson Tide for eight years and $32 million. Saban joins an Alabama team who finished 6-7 and seven this season under Mike Shula. Saban had publicly denied interest in the Alabama job in the weeks prior to his hiring, but now says his heart remains in college football because it gives him the chance to affect the lives of young people. Following the firing of head coach Jim Moore, the Atlanta Falcons quickly began the search for a replacement and found one in Louisville's head coach, Bobby Petrino. In four years at Louisville, Petrino put the Cardinals on the map, winning nine or more games in each of his four seasons. When you start in this profession, you look, you look ahead and you, and you uh, set your goals. You want to become a head football coach in the NFL. And I know not only have uh, attained that, but what, what makes it so exciting to me is, as I said yesterday, is I think that this is the best job in the NFL. And I'm very proud to be the head coach of the Atlanta Falcons. Petrino, who also served as quarterback's coach for the Jacksonville Jaguars in the 99 and 2000 seasons and as their offensive coordinator in 2001, is expected to turn around the Falcons' offense. Ensuring that Mike Vick takes the next step at the quarterback position will be an early focus for Petrino and also a measure of his success. Petrino leaves Louisville only one year into a newly structured 10-year, $25 million deal. The Falcons will pay him $24 million over the next five years. In one side of the AFC Divisional Playoff Series, Indianapolis marched into Baltimore to take on the Ravens. Indianapolis' defense held strong for a second straight week, and Adam Vinatieri kicked five field goals to boost the Indianapolis Colts over the Baltimore Ravens, 15-6. On the other side of the AFC Divisional Playoffs, New England came into San Diego to face a highly favored Chargers team. Tom Brady led New England with 280 passing yards and another fourth quarter comeback to defeat the Chargers 24-21. New England will face Indianapolis in the AFC Championship game next week. In the NFC Divisional Playoffs, Jeff Garcia and the Philadelphia Eagles battled the Saints in an electrified Superdome. New Orleans defense held strong in the fourth quarter to give the Saints a 27-24 victory. On the other side of the NFC Divisional Playoffs, Chicago took on Seattle. Rex Grossman held strong, passing for 282 yards, and Robbie Gold hit two field goals in, four, in the fourth quarter and in overtime to give Chicago the win, 27-24. Now for championship weekend. In the NFC, New Orleans travels to Chicago to take on the Bears. In the AFC, New England travels to Indianapolis to take on Peyton Manning and the Colts. Well, that's all for this New Year's edition of Capital City Sports. Tune into the show every Thursday at 8 p.m. or throughout the weekend. For Capital City Sports, I'm Jonathan Hilliard. And I'm Meredith Harvey, wishing you a happy new year and a great semester. See you next week.